Hi everyone, this is Patricia from the International Hospital Federation. Thank you very much for joining us today and I hope you're all safe and well. The IHF is hosting this COVID-19 webinar and live Q&A series to share experiences, good practices, insights, and recommendations from our members and other organizations across the globe. This series has been created with healthcare providers for healthcare providers, including decision makers and those involved in preparing for and managing COVID-19. We hope the lessons you take away from this session will help you tackle the crisis. I would now like to introduce the moderator of this webinar, IHF CEO Eric Derudenbeck. Eric? Thank you, Patricia. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Uh, welcome you to the IHF webinar series on how hospitals have faced COVID-19 situation. During past sessions, we had, uh, had the chance to hear from the learning of countries that were prepared to face COVID because they had uh, faced previous epidemic crisis uh, uh, not so long ago, like uh, in Korea, Japan, Singapore, and uh, Taiwan. Today, we'll go back to Europe to hear the experience from a country that had no in place such preparedness plan to face massive epidemics because in Europe we haven't faced any kind of epidemics like that since 1918 with the famous Spanish flu. So here it will be more about agility, rapidity, how to work without going through the standard governance and management process that usually require time. It's also about accepting to make mistakes, to build on them rather than to blame those behind decisions. It's about mobilizing all for strong common goal beyond particular interests and self-driven strategies. I'm sure we will learn a lot from this experience. For the q and I will ask you to do as much as possible focus on the uh, issues related to managerial organizational leadership questions as we are not in a format for providing answers to clinical concerns on treatments and medical protocols. Now let me introduce you our speakers, Professor Elmut Kern, who is the CEO, Hospital Brothers of St. John of Gans, uh, Vienna, Austria. Professor Kern is also the chairman of the board of the Austrian State Holding Company, which is the company that owns you know, most of the public uh, owned uh, um, uh, uh, companies. He is also chairman of the board of Statistic Austria, deputy chairman of University Council of Vienna Austria, uh, University. Before, he was a global partner at Deloitte Consulting and uh, also before the head of consultants at PricewaterhouseCooper. He teaches strategies at the Technical University Vienna. He's a member of scientific committee of our uh, Congress, and uh, we really are grateful for your contribution, Professor Ken, to the preparation of the World Hospital Congress that will this year have a very special focus on COVID. Professor Ken uh, has a degree in management history and medieval history, uh, completed program Columbia University Harvest Business School and is passionate about efficiency and deregulation. He lives in Austria, Australia, in uh, Austria, Vienna, beautiful city, and um, and has uh, his family around with him uh, to uh, complete this uh, uh, life. Doctor uh, Professor Kern, the floor is yours, and we are really eager to hear about your experience. Thank you, Eric, for the kind introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody on this webinar. Uh, I want to thank you also, uh, thank also the previous speakers and the previous presentations, which I took a lot away from and learned a lot from, and I hope that there are some things, some takeaways I can give you for today. What I'm gonna talk today is uh, that I give you a little overview over what Austria did to manage the crisis then go to what the hospital did in uh, which measures we took to manage the crisis and show you which way forward we see and which learnings we had uh, from, uh, from the, that crisis. Uh, first, let me describe the hospital. Now, the Hospital of the Brothers of St. John of God is a hospital owned by a Catholic order, the Brothers of St. John of God. is one of the oldest permanently operating hospitals in the world, actually 
We operate since 415 years in the same location, permanently open. We are a tertiary hospital with about uh, some thousand people staff, 420 beds, and an emergency department with about 140,000 patient contacts a year. So that's, in a nutshell, our house. You see the picture. We have uh, the old part with the old entrance, which you can see here in front. And the whole block is our hospital. And in the left-hand uh, back corner of the block, there's the convent of the Brothers of St. John of God, which are monks which still uh, own the hospital and still work in the hospital. So that's a, a very brief overview over our hospital. And now let's just get into the uh, jump into the topic. Uh, this picture shows you how we felt on March 13 of this year. Uh, March 13 was a defining date, and I'll come to that in a second, when Austria found out that we can't uh, avoid the crisis. And we, we felt the coronavirus like a cheetah chasing us as the antelope in front. And uh, whoever did a safari knows that the chance of the antelope is pretty low. Uh, when, when hunted by a cheetah. First, we were in the, in the herd of the, of, the, and of the gazelles, and then uh, the virus picked us and we had to, to run. So that's how we felt on 13th of March, and I'll come back to that picture later. So now, wh what happened? On the 21st of February, we had our first two COVID cases, uh, proven COVID cases in Austria, in the Tyrol, um, a touristic area in Austria. Uh, it was an Italian couple working there in the resort uh, in Ischgl, which turned out to be the hot spot and the, the spread spot uh, from where um, uh, COVID uh, developed in, in Austria. Uh, on the 27th, we had the first three cases in Vienna, which is about 500 kilometers away from the Tyrol. And the gov first government warning and the first COVID guidelines by the Ministry of Health being issued, but still no real urgency and no big pressure. On the 5th of March, we had 37 cases, mostly people returning from Italy. Uh, I'm sure we had more cases, but uh, testing did not really start, only when there were symptomatic uh, people coming to be tested. On the 6th of March, we already had 63 cases and Austrian Airlines starting cancelling flights from Corona hotspots. On the 10th of March, so very few days later, the borders to Italy were closed. Italy is a neighboring country to Austria. And you know that the north of Italy was a, a, in a pretty bad situation already at that date. So the borders to Italy were closed, the universities were closed, and events with more than 1,000 people were canceled. So pretty severe measures starting. On the 11th of March, WHO declared the pandemia and schools were partly closed in Austria. And we had the first supporting measures uh, for the economy being announced by the government. On the 12th of March, we had our first dead, uh, COVID dead in Austria. And there was an estimation of a doubling time of cases by 3.3 days. And the famous R0 factor was estimated at 1.62. So each COVID uh, ill person uh, giving the disease to another 1.6 people. And then the famous 13th of March came, a Friday, Friday the 13th, so no wonder. Uh, we had 504 cases and the government announced the full lockdown of Austria, basically uh, by the 16th of March. What does full lockdown mean? Uh, border controls were introduced, uh, hotspots were put under quarantine, uh, the economy was locked down, only supermarkets, gas stations, and other essential infrastructure facilities could remain open. And uh, people were not allowed to leave their houses except for four reasons, famous four reasons, repeated every day by the government. Either go to work in essential infrastructure, shop food, help others, or short walks to relax, as they called it. So you could move out for, they said, half an hour just to get a little bit of fresh air. That was the famous 13th of March, where we had our first real crisis meeting in the hospital. Uh, because uh, that day we decided we have to move to 
uh, crisis mode in the hospital by Monday, the 16th. So what happened over the weekend, uh, 15th of March, uh, air traffic was locked down uh, subsequent, subsequently over the following week uh, with uh, Australian Airlines uh, ceasing to operate with the Vienna airport being locked down and only open for uh, transport flights and emergency flights and to bring Austrians back home from other countries. Military service was prolonged so uh, our young uh, boys had to, to stay uh, with the military to help if required. And the government announced over the weekend the support package for, of 38 billion uh, euros for the economy. Uh, the wording was, whatever it takes, we will uh, support the economy. Just to give you uh, the size of the Austrian economy, it's about uh, 280, 300 billion euros. So that's more than 10% of, of Austrian BNP, uh, GNP, GDP. So that that what uh, happened till the 16th when all public hospitals had to operate under COVID crisis mode. Uh, I'll come to that uh, in, a, in a second. Vienna airport lockdown, we had on the 31st of March then 146 dead people and 10,000, we, we hit the mark of 10,000 COVID, uh, COVID positive uh, people. Uh, economy went down, we had 560,000 people unemployed, which was uh, a plus of 50% over over two weeks, actually. Uh, nearly 1 mil million people on short-time work. So Austria's population is 9 million people. We have about 5.7, 6 million people uh, workforce, and we had 1 million people uh, on short-time work and, and half a million unemployed. So pretty bad hit the economy, of course, as in all the other countries. Uh, 4th of April was the first decline of the infection rate, which was good. So the first signs of, of getting better uh, because those measures, uh, we believe, uh, helped a lot to slow the curve, to flatten the curve. Uh, on the 6th of April, we had uh, nose, uh, mouth, uh, mask uh, obligatory when entering shops, not in, on the street, not in open street, but when you enter the shop, you had to wear a mask. On the 10th of April, uh, was the day with the maximum COVID occupancy at ICUs. That's uh, interesting also to compare to other countries. We had on that day with the maximum occupancy, 250 ICU beds occupied by COVID patients, uh, which is about 10% of our ICU capacity. Uh, for comparison, and that's, that's also a figure that was uh, taken out very often by politicians and in comparison to other countries. Uh, we had, as, as all the other countries, the fear that ICU capacity won't be enough for treating COVID patients. Uh, so we hit the top number till now at 250. We have about 2,500 beds, ICU beds, which is per pop about three times what Italy has, about 3.5 times what the UK has, and about the same number of ICU beds per pop that uh, the United States and Germany have. So we were pretty comfortable on that side. On the 14th of April, uh, more stores could open and they allowed hardware and garden stores and all that to open. Weather was fine, Easter was coming and, and everyone could work in their gardens and shops with less than 400 square meters. That was the rule. So the big shopping malls are still closed. On the 26th, so early this week, the hospital started ramping up the services to slowly achieve what we would, would call the regular operational mode. So with the um, acceptance of the Ministry of Health and the government, all public hospitals started getting up to, to regular operations again with all the, all the uh, safety and security measures still in place, of course. On 30th, so by today, we have uh, 580 casualties we have uh, th still 1,964 people being infected at this day. We have 517 people hospitalized and 130 people in ICUs. Total uh, infections in Austria up till today were 50, some more than 15,000 over the last couple of weeks. 
247,000 tests were performed. There was always in Austria a big discussion on testing and testing, testing, testing was the credo of the government. Uh, the problem at the beginning, as in many other countries, was there were not enough PCR test uh, capacity. We had enough um, uh, enough uh, machines for PCR tests, but we didn't have enough test kits. And uh, there was hectic activity to get enough test kits. Uh, we now are okay with the test kits and have a quarter of a million people tested, which is about 2.75% of population. And the R0 factor as of today is estimated to be a little lower than 0 0.6. So a declining epidemic. So what's, what's up uh, coming tomorrow, outdoor sports facilities open, free movement is allowed. Uh, on 15th of May, the schools will reopen, all shops and shopping malls are allowed to open and restaurants and cafes uh, will reopen under certain restrictions. That's where we are today in Austria, and that's the story we had over the past couple of weeks in Austria. Uh, what did that mean for our hospital? Uh, we started with the announcement of the government lockdown, and uh, on 16th of March, as I told you before, we started operating in crisis mode. That was a pretty hectic weekend, as you can imagine, because as um, uh, Eric mentioned in his opening statement, uh, we were in Austria wasn't really prepared for an epidemic. We watched via news and TVs what happened with Ebola, we watched other epidemics, but it never happened in our country. And all the pandemic plans we had and, and all that was done, uh, we pretty quickly found out that we're not uh, suitable to handle that crisis. Interestingly enough, uh, some may have heard of a German study done in 2011 uh, to simulate a crisis and they simulated two, two crises and one of the crises simulated was an epidemic and it's, uh, that was presented to the German parliament and I can send you that, it's in German unfortunately, but it's, it's uh, really scary how those people modeled the crisis we have now. Even, even the virus was identified in, in, a, in, the, in the way it came, but as, as often when things are, are good and the sun is shining, uh, that was presented to the parliament and then nothing happened and it, uh, it was forgotten and just digged out in these days. So anyway, we, we changed the hospital over, overnight and I'll come to that on the next slide, what we did. Uh, we had in our hospital on the 18th of March, the first positive patient. And uh, that, that really gave us the sign that it, it now, now it becomes serious, right? On the 25th, uh, we started the after Corona project. Uh, that's the thing that was pretty important. We found out that we have to have a team very early, which is not dealing with the crisis uh, as it is now, to think about how we can reopen and get back to normal mode uh, after the crisis is over. On um, the 27th of March, we had a, what we call the big impact here. We had five imp uh, employees COVID positive. They were uh, infected by a patient that brought the virus into the hospital. And why could they be infected? There, as always, there's a number of things that go wrong. Uh, first is we didn't have enough PPE. We didn't have enough protection coats, enough masks and all that stuff at the beginning of the crisis. And also recommendations from scientists and from government were very different and changed every day how staff should be protected. Uh, luckily, basically on the same day, we got a big delivery of FFP2 masks. That's the K95 masks in other countries they are called. K95, uh, and we decided on the, immediately after that weekend that all clinical staff has to wear FFP2 masks, uh, and we, we separated with or without ventile, uh, depend because we had enough with the with the ventile, so we uh, we separated by by the category of where people were working. And on the 28th of March, on a Saturday, 
we got the okay of the government to be one of the, the only actually, one of two test hospitals for a mass test. And within two and a half hours after uh, the announcement that we are selected, we uh, got little, uh, nearly a third of our staff in the hospital to get uh, to, to be being tested for with a PCR test. And in that test of 330 people, we had three uh, asymptomatic detected uh, COVID cases. So FAP2 immediately implemented afterwards. And the good news is, and there was a lot of discussions going on with our medical directors in the group, uh, if that's a suitable uh, measure or not, if that makes sense or not. The only thing I can tell you is that since that day, we only had one positive uh, staff member uh, uh, being, being detected. And that staff member actually uh, brought the infection in from a meeting with other medical directors in another hospital where they were unprotected. So that's, uh, it was not a video meeting. It was unfortunately a live meeting. So we are still, uh, till then, we are without positive case in our staff. So on 14th, the government announced uh, the ease of the corona lockdown. And uh, just last Monday, we started to get back to normalization of our uh, mode, of our operating mode, which means that we ramp up uh, first the surgical departments. They are now operating at about 75% of their capacity uh, under full uh, safety measures and full measures to separate the uh, patients who could be uh, potentially infected from patients who are not infected. So what's the impact of the lockdown on patients? Uh, the hospital was basically closed from 16th of March for all non-emergencies or urgent surgical interventions. Uh, outpatient services were closed except for emergencies. Now you have to understand we have a big emergency department but emergency department in Austria is a little bit different than in most other countries because the barriers to enter a hospital are very low. And many people go to an emergency department instead of seeing their GP. So just regular patients, which are not really emergencies. So that was completely shut down. All patients can only enter the hospital after a negative PCR test. So we have a test station, uh, a pre hospital triage where PCR tests are taken for every patient. And if the test is positive, you can't enter the hospital. Only if you have a negative test, you are admitted for a surgery or for another treatment. Visitors are admitted only for in a, uh, patients in a terminal phase or uh, with a special permission. And only one visitor per patient uh, is allowed. And all the patients, are, uh, sorry, visitors are screened for COVID. Uh, there's a pre-entry test, as I uh, said before, for patients, for plant patients, and there's a pre-entry triage point for emergencies and for visitors where they uh, are, are checked for COVID. Uh, that brought the hospital occupancy down to about 30%. So we have an average of 110 to 130 beds currently occupied. What's the impact on the staff? Uh, we have uh, the rosters changed over the weekend, uh, which is a, a big thing also with labor law issues because people have from their plants uh, rosters go to an A team, B team mode where, they, where we separated them into uh, teams with one week of service in the hospital. And if we found an infected team member, the team was sent home. Uh, tested and the backup team uh, took over the ward. Uh, we implemented home office wherever possible uh, for administrative staff, of course, mainly. Uh, we use staff in non-core areas. For example, we had eye doctors helping at the uh, triage points. We had ENT doctors doing the PCR tests. Uh, we had uh, people working in other areas, which is Again, on the labor law, a little bit difficult, but everyone was pretty helpful and pretty, pretty uh, willing to, to help out wherever they could. Uh, and we decided very early that we have to do everything to take care of the staff. 
not only from the safety side, but also to make their life in that difficult situation as comfortable as possible. So what we did is that we guaranteed full payment to everyone, even if they didn't perform full hours. That was a big issue because many people, for example, the eye doctors, uh, their department was shut down and uh, they didn't work their full hours, their 40 hours a week, but we guaranteed their full payment, even if they are not here for full hours. We uh, announced that there won't be any contract terminations during the crisis. We wouldn't implement short time work in any department. Uh, we did the mass testing. So we had that single day on the 28th of March, but we continued testing of staff knowing that it's a, just a screenshot of the day, if you're positive or not, but it gave a lot of comfort to the staff that they are tested and, and, and they appreciated that a lot. And by today, we have about 85% of our staff having been tested at least once. Uh, we had a, we, we guaranteed maximum protection as we could with PPE. Uh, we implemented, a, as we had to close down our cafeteria, we changed the cafeteria to be an employee supermarket because it was difficult uh, during working hours to uh, go into supermarkets and buy stuff there. We uh, implemented a hotline for our staff, a COVID hotline, where they uh, could get explanation of the guidelines, they could ask questions, and we also implemented a psychological service where our three psychologists we have in the house were available for uh, stress uh, communication or, or any questions uh, the staff uh, would have, would raise. We, uh, offered additional kindergarten places as kindergartens and schools were shut down. We offered people who had obligations to care about uh, their people, uh, their, their children, uh, to bring them in our kindergarten and, and being taken care of there. And a uh, little thing, but we had very good resonance on that was that we, for example, also offered free disinfectant for employees' families. So lots of measures being taken just to make people happy basically, apart from safety measures being taken. On the infrastructure side, uh, you, will, uh, and, uh, you will know many things of the things we did, which are pretty common and, and most of the other hospitals did around the world. We separated entrances for employees and patients and visitors. We implemented a triage point with uh, COVID screening before entering the hospitals and we zoned the hospital in potentially infected and infected areas and in clean areas completely, uh, which also meant that we had to dissolve the ward structures uh, completely. We have currently one big surgical ward for all surgical disciplines, uh, one infected and one uninfected. Uh, and actually people liked, started liking uh, that and worked, uh, liked to work interdisciplinary and actually it works pretty well and uh, we think of continuing that uh, in the future. Uh, we are leaner than ever, uh, that means we strip down all the processes, we focus really on the essentials, which means guidelines, uh, issuance of guidelines is very quick. For example, here we have only to one clinical and one other uh, member of the board have to sign off guidelines and not the whole board as before. Uh, many other things we do in a much quicker and, and faster way. Uh, we have the, the, the just one uh, ward, I told that before. We, we merged the two departments for internal medicine we have into one temporarily because it makes uh, the rosters much easier. Uh, we changed the meal delivery process fully to have as few as possible interfaces from the meal getting from the kitchen to the, to the patients or to the staff. We delegated decisions to the lowest possible level in the organization, which was unusual for a pretty heavy organization as we usually have. Uh, as I said, we have high speed uh, release management for COVID related guidelines, which changed actually every day or even twice a day at the beginning. Uh, we train our staff permanently on COVID related guidelines and the measures and we communicate a lot and we have a, an app, an internal communication app, like a social media, like a WhatsApp, a central point of communication for our, our staff. So just a few pictures at the end to give you a glance of what we are doing. This is a 
the crisis management group, which is basically the board of the hospital, uh, medical director, nursing director, economic director, HR director, uh, the head of hygiene and head of the back office operations, myself and the prior, which you see in the, who you see in the left hand side of the picture. So he is one of the monks. He's the, basically the head of the, uh, the representative of the honors and he participated in every meeting. We had them daily at eight o'clock and at 1 p.m. at 1 p.m. an extended group with the head of the operation theater, pharmacy, logistics, communications, IT and facility management and technical infrastructure joining us. So that was the, the meetings and you see the, you can see it in the back of, of uh, my screen today and you see the white walls uh, around the corners, which usually are our huddle boards and we wiped everything out we had there and this is our, our uh, crisis management tool actually. Everything is put in handwriting on there or in printouts and that helps a lot during the crisis. This is the pre-entrance pre triage point, which I mentioned with the COVID assessments. So it's a side entrance of the hospital, people waiting there to get in being checked. This is the drive-through testing for employees. So a separate test street for our employees uh, where they are tested. We do now about 50 tests a day for employees and about 72 for patients. This is our, our surgical team with training in, in full protection equipment here in which they operate now. And this is our app that I mentioned, which turned out to be really, really helpful. It's a little bit like uh, working like WhatsApp. It has a, an information board. Uh, we implemented that about half a year ago, actually, as a tool to communicate. Everyone has it on, on his private phone. Uh, they can have chat groups, you can have uh, meeting rooms on there and uh, all our, our guidelines, everything is communicated in addition to the traditional ways via that tool. And we have the big, big picture you see here is our COVID dashboard where, where you see how many infected staff members we have. Uh, it's currently six actually. Uh, we have uh, 21 on the quarantine for different reasons and we have 23 which are all healthy back from COVID. So as if you add the numbers up, we, have, we had 29 cases in our staff total with again, about thousand staff. So what, what's next? Just quickly, the restart task, task force is working hard because we already started coming back. What are they doing? They're making a plan for handling the patient backlog. We have a huge patient backlog because of, of the shutdown of the last weeks. We have to implement slowly the, the old rosters, the traditional rosters uh, to handle the backlog and to catch up. So we start uh, also working on weekends, uh, opening the operation theater on weekends, for example, which we usually don't. Uh, we, we try to keep what worked well in the crisis and we try to implement that into day-to-day -day operations and we maintain a list of the crisis learnings to work with them when, when ramping up. And we have a separate, and I think it's very important to have a separate cleanup team on the other side. The cleanup, many things were left behind and the cleanup team will take care of what has been left behind in documentation, in uh, whatever things uh, you can imagine. There are lots of things that were not top priority now. They will clean up the mistakes in coding, for example, uh, and, and they will follow up the problems found during the crisis. So that's two separate teams, one for a restart and one for cleaning up. And that brings me to the summary slide. The key learnings is all about staff and leadership, actually. What we learned is speed beats perfection. Uh, uh, scientists uh, give us a lot of guidelines and and government gave us a lot of guidelines and regulations, and we learned to mistrust them, not because they were bad or we would know better, but we learned pretty quickly that no one really knew how that epidemic will behave. And uh, we tried a lot of things, and if they worked, we kept them, and if they didn't work, we abandoned them and tried something else. Of course, guidelines were helpful, but we, we didn't stick always to the guidelines. 
uh, leadership is of the essence. People were pretty unsecure when the wave came. We are not used to epidemics here. Uh, people are not trained for epidemics. People, people had fear for, their, for themselves, for their families. And uh, you've got to be pretty, and that's the next point, pretty decisive uh, when you go ahead. And it's, it turned out to be better to have a quick decision, a quick, not, not a, a, a quick, uh, deliberate, uh, educated decision, but still quick and not to wait till you have complete information. But when you decide quickly, which people appreciate, you also got to take care you're, that you're not divisive because people have different opinions and you don't have the time to have the whole discussion process when you take decisions. At one point you have to say, okay, this, we have discussed enough, now we got to take a decision. But that you have to do in a, in a non-divisive way. And uh, what we also turned out, we had a, a few disappointments and many, many uh, very positive surprises uh, what skills and what qualities people develop in such a crisis. And what we learned is that when you take care of your staff and they know and feel that they are taken care of, then the staff takes care of all the rest actually. And that makes management much, much easier. And uh, the point, and, and that's my last slide now, the whole point, if you want to have it in one picture, is that we changed it. The, the whole thing was about changing being uh, the game to being the predator. We decided we want to be chasing the COVID virus and not to be chased by the virus itself. And uh, it's, it's just a matter of mindset, that picture. But when you tell people that they are not being pushed around by the virus, but they can take action and they can manage it, that helps a lot in, in, in getting things done. So basically, that's it. Uh, and I'm happy to discuss on a one-on-one -on -one basis at a scheduled time. And now, Eric, back to you for managing the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation and many interesting points. And definitely this uh, first slide and last slide is, is, uh, are so important because uh, I fully uh, uh, support the, the fact that, you know, the overall mindset of the, the group that is uh, in charge makes a big difference. I have a few technical questions that are somehow clarification requests from your presentation. Yes. So uh, a question around the FP2 masks, uh, were they distributed because you only mentioned this kind of mask and while the many hospitals use also surgical masks. So how did you do? Did everybody wear FP2 masks, whether when not looking to suspected patients? Well, yeah, everyone, actually, we, we started with no masks at the beginning because we didn't even have enough surgical masks. They were provided very quickly. That, that was a big, big discussion in the hospital, but they were provided quickly. So people started wearing uh, the operational uh, surgical masks. Uh, then we had that big impact and uh, we said we have to do something. And our stock of FFP2 masks was pretty low, but we said we start now distributing FFP2 for clinical uh, staff uh, and hope that uh, we get uh, more supply soon. And supply came actually on the next day. And we have enough masks, FFP2, uh, uh, to sustain operations and give a fresh clinical, uh, a fresh FFP2 mask to clinical staff every day. Why do we give it to every day and not only uh, people uh, who work with uh, COVID uh, cases or COVID suspect cases? Because it turned out that the screening process, and, and that's a learning which is unfortunate, uh, the screening process gives you more or less random results. Uh, because when we take people from screening to PCR testing, there's no correlation between positive PCR and positive screening or negative screening actually. So we, we said basically every, everyone entering the house is suspect of having COVID. And that's why everyone in the clinical area got an FFP2. Okay, in, in relation with the screening, another question on the how, because you, you mentioned that you systematically start to do the, the tests and uh, uh, that means you were able to get the regnants for the PCR. 
yeah. how fast would the test result and and how did you manage the waiting time between you know testing and result yeah okay. and, uh, very and good question long discussion we had before that actually uh, we have our own lab uh, having a capacity now of about 70 tests per day in uh, three shifts. So from getting the test in the lab, it's about three to four hours till we get the result. Uh, so what we decided for patients entering the house, plant patients, not emergency patients, plant patients entering the house, get their test two days before their, uh, their planned admission. We say that the diagnostic window of the two days from a negative test to uh, admission is a risk we are ready to take because people in, in that uh, two days, we tell them uh, to stay home, not to have contacts and all that. And even if it's too early because they would develop uh, COVID uh, only after five, six, seven days, uh, we take the risk of those two days. Uh, the risk actually is there for other patients and less for the staff because staff is well protected. And we try to separate patients as much as we can. So we try to limit the risk, even if there's that diagnostic window. Uh, for non-planned patients, for real emergency patients, when they are uh, suspect, they get to a, um, an interim award, where as long as it's not clear if the test is negative or positive, uh, they stay in an in a infected ward, well protected, not in contact with other infected staff in, in single rooms. And uh, once the test is positive, they get to the infection station. And once the test is negative, they get back to a normal ward, uninfected ward. Okay. Uh, and the test time, we get the first, the ones we, we take in the morning, we get back at lunchtime. Uh, the ones we uh, send into the lab at lunchtime, we get back at four o'clock in the afternoon and the afternoon tests we get back in the morning at eight o'clock. And the uh, tests for the employees, uh, we send to another lab, which has a big capacity and uh, we get them back within 48 hours. Okay, yeah, so that's good clarification. Another question that I ask myself is, uh, we have seen that, you know, in Asian countries, uh, the temperature screening has been one of the key strategy and you haven't mentioned it so i guess you have discussed it and can you tell us why uh, this was not so much adopted yeah. we, we have discussed it we had uh, it's actually it's pretty cheap to implement it actually uh, we told the staff to uh, measure uh, their temperature every morning before they come to uh, to the hospital and we trust they, they do that. Uh, we tell patients they should do that before entering the hospital. Actually, we, we didn't find, unfortunately, we didn't find correlation from our triage point to the PCR test between temperature and, and COVID positive or negative. Too many people have just a normal infect. It's, now it's the time for the winter time, it's the time for the normal cold and normal infects, not COVID and we didn't find any correlation between temperature and, and COVID positive or negative. So we decided not to do it. Okay. Uh, another question uh, around, you know, the fact that you had to put in place, you know, very quick responses and uh, new protocols. Uh, do you foresee any medical malpractice litigation problem that may come? Uh, Sorry, any, any, what problem, any? Litigation, malpractice, no, no, okay. you know, people shooting you because, uh, you know, under crisis, everybody is happy to have uh, the response. But after when it's calmed down, if people have the feeling that they haven't been treated the best way, they maybe say, OK, this was the panic at the hospital. That is the reason. No, actually, we, we don't. On the patient side, we don't. Because uh, uh, everything we implemented and we really tried to be ahead of the curve and learn from other countries, learn from what was done in Singapore, Taiwan and, and other countries and to be ahead of the curve and everything that came out was implemented by us and other hospitals before actually so the ministry of health was uh, was always uh, slower than we were and so we're on the safe side on that and we always did more than was requested by by uh, authorities uh, 
we would expect, we hope it doesn't come, but we would expect litigation on the labor law side. Labor laws are pretty strict in Austria and our, our um, union representative here was pretty unhappy with a couple of things we did. But the, the, the interesting thing is actually that uh, the staff appreciated a lot what we did and they stopped following the union representative who wanted to negotiate things in the middle of the crisis. Uh, it's, it's less about protection and safety of, of employees. It's really more about, uh, about uh, payment. And people said, uh, people declared they wouldn't follow the union representatives because they felt taken care well and they felt they had to do everything they could to help in the crisis. So on the labor side, the labor law side maybe, but unlikely. Okay, thank you, that's very clear. Uh, one question about maternity services. You mentioned a lot about surgery, but yeah. I don't know if your hospital, you have a maternity, but if you have, uh, did it run a uh, uh, normal business or did you no. have to put in place very specific protocols? We, we don't have maternity award. We, we don't have births in our hospital. Uh, we have a gynecology, but only a surgical gynecology. Uh, the only uh, standard operation that was uh, maintained is the stroke unit. We have a pretty big stroke unit with, uh, that was separated completely, separate entrance and all that. And the stroke unit was operated in normal mode. Okay. There is uh, also a technical question. I'm not sure we, we can really have response here. It's uh, about uh, reproduct, reproductivity and recovery of tests for detection, for detection of COVID. Yeah. Do you have uh, anything you can say about that? Or? Well, if with the reproduction is meant the R0 factor, uh, I mentioned two things. We know there's a huge, huge uh, uncertainty in those numbers. The only thing we know for sure we are below one because the the, the curve is really going down. Uh, we have about 60 new infections uh, as of uh, today. We had on the, on the top day, we had 1,000 new infections per day. Now we are below 60. Uh, the repro uh, reproduction rate is really, uh, many scientists discuss it. We, we just know it's below one. Uh, we don't have re really reliable data on that. And the tests, uh, I'm not sure if that was a question, but we trust there's no false positive PCR tests. There may be false negative, but unlikely. Uh, we had one case where we had problems with the PCR tests, which turned out to be a, a mixture of technical and human problem, but we, we rely on PCR. We don't rely on any other tests and we don't do the quick tests. We don't do uh, uh, antibody tests at the moment because we don't think they're reliable enough. We wait till we get uh, confirmation from from uh, government and from science that tests are reliable. There was an early question on, you know, how quickly did the government put in place the lockdown? I mean, did you have the feeling that it is because the government has taken the right measures mm -hmm. from a term of public health? that uh, you were more in a situation that you could handle the wave uh, from mm -hmm. the COVID crisis and turn around and chase the virus rather the virus chasing you? There's an interesting question. There's a two sides to the coin. Uh, we believe, and there's in every country there's discussion if the measures were too strict, not too strict, and what should have been done. And uh, looking back, it's always easy to judge. But we, we are pretty happy actually in Austria with our government and government has extremely high uh, positive feedback from even from newspapers and from population because they also were very clear, very decisive, very quick and also announced with a two week um, pre-log uh, what they would do in the next two weeks. So people could uh, make their minds up and, and uh, plan and prepare for what's up to come. And they always explained why they are doing that. Of course, there was discussion if it's right or wrong, but people accepted that something has to be done. And the results we have uh, with flattening the curve uh, help a lot. Now the discussion is more about economic impact. That's the one side. So positive on that side. Negative is that Austria, a small country with only 9 million people, has a federal 
uh, structure of uh, the health system. So each region is responsible for their, only, uh, for their own health system and the Ministry of Health has basically no direct uh, um, responsibility and no way to order things to be done. Now we have nine regions in Austria. So Vienna is the biggest region with two million people. And it turned out that our Ministry of Health, which handled the crisis well in the situation it, it, it was, but it didn't have the measures, it didn't have the tools to really implement things fast and quickly. They had to go to the nine local governments of the provinces to convince them to do things. They then implemented things in a different way. And that, that's also one of the reasons why many hospitals uh, said, okay, let's not wait for guidelines or whatever. Let's just do what the ministry uh, wants us to do and maybe do more, but uh, let's not be too strict and not wait for what local governments do. Okay. And of course, we were not doing things against the ruling of local governments or against guidelines, but uh, we took a little bit of, every hospital took a little bit of freedom to, to uh, take their own measures. And we had a very good communication amongst all the public hospitals uh, to check if we do the same things and uh, to learn from each other what works with one hospital and what works with the other. Yeah, your hospital is a private, uh, non-for-profit, uh, faith-based hospital. Mm -hmm. Were there any differences between this, your hospital, purely mm -hmm. public hospital or private, you know, investor-owned hospitals? No, Were you we, we, we are private, but part of the public system. So we operate it like a public hospital. Uh, versus the private hospitals uh, having private patients with uh, private insurance, for example. Uh, they were in, in big trouble because they were still having normal operations, but at a low scale. And uh, just two weeks or three weeks ago, they were integrated basically in the public system and started helping up, uh, helping ramping up operations. and operations funded by the public systems are now uh, done in private hospitals. So they are part of the crisis management now. Okay, so like the experience that we had from France, exactly. where the public uh, system handled mostly the crisis, uh, but give to the private investor own more room to take over the, the regular patients, if I can exactly, say. Exactly, exactly. Uh, okay, and, and uh, related to that, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the financing? Um, you know, if you said you had 30% of your activity, uh, mm -hmm. did you have to face uh, a reduction of your funding or was it uh, neutral because you have a budget that is given to you regardless? Or did you even have extra money because you, you had to, to get more mm -hmm. uh, kits and whatever? That's, that's interesting and I think we are in a very particular and uh, lucky situation here. I wouldn't, would never say that to our authorities giving us finance, but I think we're in a lucky situation because our system is uh, structured in a way that we uh, basically have full cost coverage for our operations based on the budget for the current year and we get uh, quarterly prepayments. Uh, for that. So we are in a normal year. We are well covered. Our cost is covered. And the the interesting thing is as operations went down, the revenue from Social Security went down. But uh, that on the other hand is covered by, uh, by more subsidies to cover our costs. So actually we have less cost currently uh, than compared to normal operations because our staff is paid normally, but we have less working hours because with these split and A and B teams and only 30% occupancy, we have less people in the hospital on a day-to-day -day basis. Of course, we have higher costs with the testing, with uh, protection equipment, with all, all things around that. Uh, but we are still very comfortable and we have uh, not official uh, response, but inofficial response that all hospitals will get coverage for all their costs at the end of the crisis. And we deliver reports now on additional cost to the authorities. Uh, and we are very confident we will get our cost covered because we don't think any politician in Austria and maybe not in other countries 
could at the end after the crisis afford to go uh, to tell the public that uh, hospitals have deficits or have to close down because they didn't get funding uh, when they helped in the crisis. Yeah. So we are in a lucky position here in Austria, actually. Okay, thank you. A question about, you know, the protection and the, so you, you probably have a central sterilization department. Yes. You had to put special procedures with the COVID uh, uh, or it just worked uh, like usual because the central the cent sterilization yeah. is, is providing steri sterile devices anyhow. Yeah, no, no extra things there except that the FFP2 masks uh, uh, are sterilized once after that was being tested and, uh, and accepted by authorities. We additionally to the other stuff, we sterilized the FFP2 masks one, one time. Okay, so that's, that's also good. And last question that I'll, because before summarizing, are you, while you said that you were getting back to, to normal, are you also putting provisions to take care of a second wave? Yeah, important question. I forgot to mention that actually. Uh, the way we ramp up our, our operations is that we do what we call it in a modular way. So we put one piece by piece on top of the operations. And if we have to uh, go down to crisis mode again, we can take those pieces back piece by piece. So now we know what to do when operating in crisis and we know exactly how we can get back into crisis mode if required. Okay, thank you very much. So let me, if, uh, if you allow me to, to say, summarize, uh, of course you had a very nice slide with key learning. So this one, I don't need to repeat it, uh, but are very important from the perspective of uh, how to handle that from a, a management uh, and leadership perspective. I want, however, to underscore the idea of protecting the staff that is much more than just, you know, doing the PPE, uh, to just much more than just uh, making sure that they get their salary, is also uh, psychological support, is also making their daily life easier so that they can really fully dedicate to their work. And what you, you mentioned about the relation with the trade union is really demonstrating the importance of having a proactive, uh, comprehensive approach of making sure that you, you, you really support the staff. The other, I think, important lesson is, the, the, is, ha is having a large capacity in ICU. And I think we need, uh, from, as an industry, I mean, the, to better understand you know, the differences between countries and what does it mean. Uh, because uh, in terms of practices and protocols, uh, because definitely having a stronger capacity helps uh, the hospitals to be uh, more at ease uh, in, in responding to crises. The other important element is uh, the interdisciplinary approach that this crisis has supported and for which uh, it can be uh, implemented further and far beyond the crisis. And this is something that has been uh, advocated for many years and that has been very difficult to, to implement. And perhaps the crisis is going to, you know, in terms of change management, do the acceleration that is, that is very important. The other thing which is part of change management is that we know, you know, it's how complicated it is. And uh, this uh, situation of crisis is also an important opportunity to learn uh, how acceptance can be very quick when uh, people really feel the sense of urgency. You know, it's a basic of management courses when you say, and that this is real. Uh, that is not a fake urgency, but it is real urgency. And here we really have the demonstration that uh, in terms of change management, when there is a real perceived urgency, the acceptance is so high. And the, the uh, other important is, uh, I think uh, one that has been also coming in, in many questions is, is it's important that everybody gets the right information through a one channel and have a very updated information and the fact that you had already an, a tool 
for communication with the hospital has certainly be a, a very important support. And that's certainly something that can be a strong recommendation for hospital to develop such tools because it's part of the cohesion, but it's also part of making sure that people feel uh, less fearful because they have immediate and uh, good information uh, uh, and, and a sense of community because this is a, a tool that is for themselves and around the hospital. So these are the highlights that are, and lessons that I wanted to underscore. Professor Kern, do you have any other comments, uh, final comments before we close the, the, this uh, webinar? And again, I really thank you for your contribution, your insights and, and uh, uh, very interesting experience. No, no more remarks. Thank you, Eric, for the opportunity to uh, talk to the community. I hope uh, some takeaways for everyone and thank you for staying till the end. Thank you. Patricia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you very much, Helmut, and everyone who joined us today. Um, again, we will have the webinar recording available on our website. Um, in a few days and you will be notified by email once it's available. Uh, we hope you can join our upcoming webinars in the next few weeks. So we have the schedule posted on your screens right now and you can register on our website. Just go to www.ihf-fih.org slash webinars. Um, on Tuesday, May 5th, Dr. Luis Santos Pinheiro will discuss the major steps Central Hospitalar Universitario Lisboa Norte had taken mm -hmm. in adapting the hospital structure and processes with their healthcare professionals. Um, we hope you can join us uh, in that webinar. Uh, we hope you keep safe um, and healthy, and together we will overcome this global crisis. Thank you again for joining us. Helmut, thank you so much um, for the insights you've shared. Have a good day, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you and have a good day everyone.